recorder and get, and get the um, um, get the meeting going. Yeah, welcome to the September um, 2022 SVFIG meeting. Um, I'm Dave Jaffe uh, in Mountain View, California, uh, actually close by to Brad. Um, and um, I'll be sort of, uh, you know, running things today. Kevin is on the road um, after recovering from COVID. So uh, he, he is okay. Um, he's just taking some time off. So we have just a couple um, formal presentations today. Uh, we have our September uh, fourth challenge, uh, which um, Bill Ragsdale has put together. Bill is on the road right now as we speak. So he pre-recorded his presentation, which we will be, which Brad will be playing um, shortly. Uh, later on, we're, we'll hear from uh, Sam Falvo uh, about um, um, his um, programming uh, paradigm that he's been working on for um, for many years. Um, get an update on that. And then, you know, we'll have some time for discussion. And so um, to sort of um, get you thinking about these things, um, I think it might be good to go around. We have a small group go around and talk about, you know, what we've been doing in fourth with a focus on the applications that we've done, not just playing around with it or developing new versions, but what we have used for four, uh, either now or in the past, you know, maybe just, just uh, uh, mention uh, one item. Um, another discussion item will be a uh, fourth day coming up in November. Certainly we want to have people present at fourth day. Um, so think about what you might want to present. Um, and uh, for people who are local, and maybe it's just um, a few of us, we want to discuss the option of the local people uh, having a watch party at Stanford and see if there's enough interest in doing that. Okay. So, uh, Stephen, could you mute? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, without... Uh, any, any initial questions before we get started? Okay. Um, so I'll turn it over to Brad, who will um, uh, start the video of um, uh, Bill Ragsdale's fourth challenge. Take it away, Brad. All righty. Um, let me go ahead and... Well, good morning. This is Bill Ragshaw here with the Fourth Interest Group. Pleased to join you by tape delay on September 23rd, 2020. I'm traveling at the moment, so we get this pre-prepared presentation. Okay, so the discussion today is on integer conversion, and that would be integer conversion into text. It could be driving a uh, voice system, or it could be uh, driving a report writer. So our goal is to write the number uh, using text conversion, covering integers 0 to 100. I'll leave it to the user to worry about neg negative numbers and, uh, and uh, fractional uh, or uh, non-integer uh, non numbers. The conversion algorithm I use uh, overall is first uh, to use case structures. So I factor the numbers into chunks by decade. I use case structure. I would look on it uh, very much askance if you did a 100-way uh, case statement going from 0 to 100. Um, in this case, the uh, code is much more compact. The second is then that we process by decades. So the decade 0 covers 0 through 9. And we go up to the decade 9, which goes uh, 0 to 9, or goes 9, 90 to 99. And then the decade 10, in our case, is truncated just to the number 100. I also discussed, uh, discovered an exception handling even decades. A word like 90 is expressed as 90 
but 91 has a hyphen in it. So we have to process uh, the even decades slightly different than all the, uh, the remaining numbers, for example, 91 to 99. And also I discovered uh, English has some special handling for the numbers uh, 10 through 19. And finally, we should report an out of range error if our uh, conversion uh, gets a, uh, uh, improper input. So here's the uh, working part of the uh, text. First, I create a text buffer. It has uh, 31 bytes. This allows for a count and 31 characters in the string. And then finally, a uh, scratch buffer that is identical. I'm using Win32 4, and I discovered that it has a rich selection of string operators, but does not have a concatenate. So I developed my own. Concatenate uses three string addresses. These are counted strings. So address one and address two are the two input strings. And then address three is the address of the buffer where the concatenation has been completed. We can see that in the code, there are three sections. The first C move uh, transfers the uh, first string's uh, text to the buffer. The second C move appends the uh, second portion of uh, text. And finally, that C store at the bottom in place, uh, inputs the final count into the string buffer. We're getting into the work now. Do units converts the integers to a single string. So we begin by executing 10 mod. This then limits our numbers 0 through 9. And the case statement then picks a proper response. In the case of the number 0, C quote 0 will give us a counted string, uh, the address of the counted string. And likewise, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way down to 9. So each case returns a counted string of the proper code. There's an abort units error at the bottom just for completeness, although it should never execute. Let's look at the do tens. This is handling our uh, second decade, 0 through 19. This is where the most of the irregularities occurs. As do tens begins, we uh, duplicate the number so it can be reused. And then we check, is, it a, uh, uh, is that value a 10? If so, we uh, drop the input number and then the output text is C quote 10, followed by C quote quote, which is a null string. So again, we get for 10, we get the text string 10 followed by a null string. The same way with 11, 12, and 13, but at 14, we find an irregularity. At that point, we can uh, simplify things a little bit by building on the unit conversion. So look up at add team. At add team, in this case, we do the do units. So for 14, it will give us the word four, and then the C quote teen will, will append the word teen after that. 15, however, is a regular because if we'd used the add teen, we would have gotten 15. Well, 15 is not correct. So in this case, we have to give a full literal string, 15 and a null string. For 16, 17, 18, we can use that simplification above of giving the integer and, and adding the word team. Here's a fix up for decades. The decades will follow in just a moment. But what I found, of course, is that in, uh, in English, a, uh, the word 90 is uh, a single text word 90, but 91, when written, uh, has a hyphen. So if you were doing conversion for a voice output, you would leave the hyphen out. But if you're doing a report writer and you wanted that uh, text to be shown, you have to include the hyphen. So do, de do decade is a fix up. It takes the input number, checks to see if it's an even decade. If so, if it's 90 or so on, it just appends the uh, C, uh, uh, the null string. The else part appends the uh, hyphen. So again, we'll see, we'll get uh, the proper 90 or 91 with the hyphen. There's the full word that can, does conversion for everything. This is the master word that converts all decades. It takes an integer in and it comes out with the two strings. The string may be the uh, a null string. The dupe 100 greater than over and so on, I check for out of range, both positive and negative. If it passes that, 
we do a dupe tan to divide and pass the quotient to case. This will now make a check to see if it's a decade between uh, zero and 10. If it's a decade 10, of course, that has to be the one number 100 only. And so in this case, we give a literal C quote 100 with a null string. If the quotient turns out to be nine, then we, we, uh, we start with the, uh, the uh, counted string for 90 and then do the decade. And remember, just before we saw the decade, we'll either uh, append a null string or it, will, or it will append a hyphen and the units. Well, all the way down then, uh, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. 2, of course, is 20 is regular, and so that will handle between 20 and 29. If the quotient is one, now we will do the do chains. So this member handles between 10 and 19. And if the quotient is zero, it will do the do units and append a C quote. So we see there are quite a number of irregularities that had to be uh, coped with in such a translation. This is our top level uh, report writer word. At the bottom, look at full. Full is used for testing purposes. It does a uh, 100 zero do loop. Will give us the integers of one through 100. Uh, CR I 4.R gives us a new line and prints out the number we're converting. And I convert dot one will do the conversion and display. Looking up above at convert one, we input with the with a particular number. We pass it through all decades, which will give us the, the uh, two strings. We then specify the output buffer, which is output text, and then concatenate. So concatenate takes the two input strings, concatenates them into the output buffer. Next step is we recover the address of that buffer. We do a simple count and type, which displays the word. Now let's look at our results. The output example, as we would expect from zero to nine, it's just a simple word. From 10 to 19, we see 10, 11, 12, uh, 13 are from literals. 14, remember, does a four, appends a team. 15 is a literal value. 16, 17, 18, and 19 does an integer conversion and then appends team. Here are some examples of the higher decades. Again, we see from 20 to 29, it converts as we'd expect from 20, 21, and so on. And then finally, the last decade, 90. That was 91, 2, 3, 4, up to 99. And finally, the last uh, decade, 100. Uh, here are the, uh, uh, the summaries and the, and the surprises that I saw. First, the programming took more effort than I anticipated. I thought this would be something to sit down and literally just type from the keyboard. But when I got into things like the string conversion and the, uh, the uh, tens decades, I took more effort than I thought. As I mentioned before, Win32 4th has no string concatenate, and that itself was the highest uh, work task. I ended up having to design and rewrite that about three times. As we've seen, there were many irregularities in the low numbers. I'll note that our children will learn this by road. They just learned this by learning 10, 20, 30, 40, or, or 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And they don't stop to think about where the hyphen goes. On that basis, though, how do non-English speakers learn? I guess they have to learn by rote, by memorizing, because there are no rules that tell you when the uh, when 15 is really said as 15. And finally, for voice response, uh, the hyphen would be omitted. So thank you for your kind attention. We've uh, enjoyed this presentation, and we'll turn it back now to Ferris Leader Kevin. All righty. Um... Uh, so, uh, I actually prepared a, an implementation as well, if, and I'll spend some time presenting it. Or do others have uh, an implementation of this challenge as well? Uh, we could... All right, well, let me go ahead and share what I did. Um, all right, is that visible? Cool. So, um, I, I took a, a similar but, but slightly different tack on, on the problem. Um, uh, initially, um, for, I, I had this word uh, digit dot, which is a little bit of a misnomer unless you've got 12 fingers, but um, to handle sort of the lower, the lower values. And I went ahead and implemented 
things in my micro e fourth, which uh, up until yesterday did not have a, a case statement. Uh, looking at this and, and, and sort of how, how awkward it is, it made me contemplate it. But before I went, went to, the, to the business of, of adding a case statement to micro e fourth, I, uh, I came up with this uh, uh, sort of clever, too clever uh, variant of, of things using the dictionary. And so the thought was to create a word numbers that uh, populates the dictionary uh, with a, a series of uh, uh, just a series of words using create. And then uh, the digit word uh, simply walks the links in the dictionary to print uh, the, the appropriate uh, value from uh, 1 to 12. It's notable that I'm intentionally um, not emitting 0 in this word because that'll prove later to be convenient. So it, 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 this particular word prints nothing for 0. Another thing to point out is that where, where Bill put a lot of hard work into being able to redirect the output uh, to an alternate buffer, I'm, I'm printing directly to the console. Um, I have, I'll show something later that, that uh, makes that not as bad as it might seem in terms of uh, plugging this code into something else. Um, next, I've got a word called stem that um, takes advantage of a, a pattern that I noticed in, in words, which is that, uh, or in the, in the number words, which is that uh, if you think about um, starting from 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and so on, and you compare those to uh, to 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80, uh, you find that the, um, the way in which uh, a ty is appended uh, to form the, the tens uh, is, mirrors what you get with the teens. And so there are a few that are irregular and that don't use the same, uh, the same value, uh, or sorry, the same uh, sort of stem uh, as, the, as the plain digit. Um, but they happen to be three of them at least are irregular for uh, for both uh, uh, for both the uh, the teens and the and the and the tens uh, and then uh, twenty I, happens to just be sort of on its own um, so um, but again I, I you know with the stem word I'm realizing it's like gosh it would be nice to have a, a, an implementation of case. So uh, after, after a little turning, this is the implementation that I ended up adding to micro e fourth and the bleeding edge version if you were to sync the, the GitHub. Um, it basically just builds a giant uh, if else uh, sort of nested for the whole thing. It does have me wondering actually, I usually avoid the, the, uh, the case uh, construct in, in fourth, at least the ants one. And I've, I'm now kind of left wondering, you know, in comparison to, uh, say a language like C, where where a case statement is, or switch statement is used as an opportunity to to build a, a lookup table. The way that case and end case are are done in, in fourth actually don't uh, don't sort of allow for that because you're they're not constrained to um, to know at compile time the the set of uh, values being used. Which got me now wondering if maybe there's a, a slightly better way to to structure case that would allow for that. Um, but that's a problem for another day. Uh, in any event, th with, with case, I can rewrite my, my stem word a, a little bit more tersely like this. Um, and then uh, I've got this one additional word, uh, question ty, which, which optionally uh, either adds a ty or adds a ty dash, depending on if it's uh, the number in question is, uh, uh, has a zero. And, and then sort of the main glue of everything is this raw number, which for the numbers less than 13 uses the digit directly. For the numbers less than 20, uh, it, used, it uh, prints the stem and then prints teen. And for the numbers less than 100, it does a, a slash mod by 10, printing the stem and the ty, and then the digit for the rest of the word. Um, and then I, I, went, I went a little further, and then for thousands, you can divide by 100, or sorry, for 100, you can, you know, do slash mod 100, and then recursively call yourself to print the hundreds, and then the same thing for the, the thousands, the millions, and the billions. Um, and then you'll notice this, this raw number, the reason it's raw is it doesn't handle zero, because zero ends up being just special enough that uh, it's worth handling on its own. So I put sort of the exterior uh, bounds check for, for negatives, and then a printing of zero, 
and then print the raw number. Um, so that 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 functions, and, and we'll, we'll show that in a second. Um, Bill said an interesting thing in the in the motivating statement for the problem, which was to feed all of this into a speech synthesizer. So I, so I thought, well, okay, that's that, let's let's try that. So I've got uh, a uh, a bit of plumbing to to call out to an external speech synthesizer, and maybe maybe we'll take it one step further in the future and, and try to do our own speech synthesis. But for now, I uh, I, I figure this sort of adds to, to it the, the need to put the, the entire word in a buffer. Well, I'm printing to the to uh, uh, just directly to output, but in micro e uh it's possible to override the, the definition of type using is uh, and redirect your output somewhere else. And so I created a, a word called pad type, which types to the pad, and then uh, a set of words, double, double uh, curly brackets to uh, to sort of start outputting to the pad and then end up, end up putting to the pad. Um, and then I use the facility in micro e to call out to, uh, to uh, words that I can import uh, from the system and import a word called system, coincidentally, that lets you invoke a command. And then for my implementation of numbers, say, I generate a, a Unix command line that glues together a call to eSpeak uh, Z, which I think clips the end of the, the, the sort of end pause, prints the number wrapped with quotes, um, and then I pause a little bit at the end because for reasons I have not been able to figure out, eSpeak uh, does not exit the moment the speech ends, but slightly before it, which causes some, some glaring effects. Um, and then I can loop through and, and uh, print out a bunch of test numbers. So let me go and... Um, let me switch which thing I'm showing, and I will show the console. And so, um, so this is sort of uh, let's. This is so V two of this has just the printing, and I'll show that first. Uh, oopsie, if I can redirect it. So that just prints sort of all the numbers, and you can go really, really high. Um, if you want with it, and then uh, the uh, and then let me let me go ahead and run this one, which I I don't have it print right away, and uh, you can also print just to show you can print really big numbers. I'll print a uh, a really big number and then do number print, and you get. Uh, that and you can similarly, you could go and do number, number say, 123,456,789,123. Um, and, and then I've got my test loop that goes through and prints Zero, them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. And, and, and you get the idea. So, <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, yeah, as Bill said, I think kind of a, a surprisingly uh, fun little problem that has has kind of layers and, and uh, it's also kind of made me wonder uh, what little I know of numbers uh, in some languages other than English. There's some other interesting irregularities in, in some of those that be a fascinating problem to solve around uh, a number of different languages, I'm sure. Um, cool. Any commentary, further thoughts on that topic? Hi, can you hear me? This is Liang here. Yes. Yeah, I'm. I, I speak Chinese, so I think, uh, as you may know, Chinese uh, syllables are very simple for numbers, right? It's uh, exactly one syllable for each num each digit. Yeah, so it sounds like this: uh, 一, 二, 三, 四, 五, 六, 七, 八, 九, 十. So I just did one to ten just now, and then you just repeat it for for all, any combination of numbers. Uh, you know, uh, whatever digits you do. So yeah. So not every, not every every language has this this being irregular. Certainly, yeah, that's 
very order, or, orderly and, and, and carefully uh, structured, it sounds like, in Chinese. Interesting. Are you going to share your code so that we can we can make it for other languages? Certainly, I I, I typically post these to my uh, uh, I've got a a, a a GitHub with all my presentations. I think I, I haven't pushed it yet, but I will push it push it momentarily. So, and and also send me the slides for posting on the SVFig website. I will go ahead and do that. My only my only comment. Uh... It would be one of the things is the, the it's a, it was an interesting problem but but sort of clearly just it's the detailed logic but boy brad you know as usual uh just picked it out of the ballpark the only thing i'd say at the cozy level is all the redundant words would disappear when you've got a table of of conditions and so forth you just would have a couple of tables and 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 then a a uh a bit of language to um, apply the conditions and you know suck out them, but so you don't have these big tables of redundant uh, verbiage, which is one of the things I hate. That's in all languages other than array languages. Um, yeah, I did. I did actually find myself wondering. Well, do I want to? Would Would this be easier if I could just have have that array of kind of the the, the lookup or the yeah. the, the, the yeah, cases I, sort of just I, of data I, instead of code? I I, I have a, a real aversion to redundancy, um, but that's uh, that's pretty uh, uh, pretty spectacular generalization of of uh, and also I. Made a note there that uh, that number talk, that number speak thing, the uh, uh, app I guess you've got is. Uh, it's a is, it's a regular uh, pa package on uh, Unix. Is actually the, the irony is that I believe that it uh, it has built into it uh, handling for for numbers. So if you just sent it the raw numeric uh, this number string, it would save them just fine. So it's sort of a little bit of an artificial exercise. Uh, to use it, but uh, it, 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 it's been very interesting to watch somebody else do this problem. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, I, I agree, Bob. That's so, really interesting to, to see how other people, you know, break down the, the problem and implement a solution. It's it's really enlightening to see the differences in the way Bill does things, which seems to be very um you know fundamental standard uh stuff and then then there's brad who <laughs> uh, um uh you know comes up with um amazing solutions so uh thank you thank you brad thank you well thank uh, you brad any, any other uh comments on the on the fourth challenge um, just one thing um if I know that some people have asked questions about, you know, why, why the irregularities exist. Um, not too long ago, I stumbled upon a YouTube channel called Rob Words. Uh, it's a uh, British fellow who uh, goes into the history of the English language. Um, and it turns out that a surprising number of words that we use today uh, come from a variety of influences dating as far back as Old Norse. Um, mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, he has a video that talks about how our numbers are formed. Don't quote me on that, but I think he does. Um, so that might be of interest to people who are who are curious to know uh, the history of the, the uh, vocabulary that we use. Yeah, uh, Sam, if you, if you can find that link again, could you put it um, in the chat or send it uh, to me by email? Uh, yeah, I can do. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. So um, I think what we'll do now is um, rather than uh, go immediately into Sam's uh, presentation, maybe we'll do a little bit of, a, a, of um, we'll go around the Zoom and each of us will, um, you know, introduce ourselves, um, say where we're from and how we use forth and give an uh, example of an application that you used in in fourth recently um or or something that you just like to talk about so um i'll go first <laughs> um and then brad will be after me and then we'll go through the, uh, the list of um, 
all 11 people that are on the Zoom meeting. So um, again, I started using Forth in uh, 1980. Um, I was at, at Stanford and we were looking for um, a language to, um, to teach in, in, a, in a mechatronics class um, other than basic. And I recall that uh, Kim Harris um, uh, was hired to um, instruct uh, uh, me and the uh, professor uh, about fourth. And he had this giant binder of, um, of notes that he went through. Um, and I think we digitized them. I think um, um, Yeah, I think we had a copy and, and we uh, scanned it. Um, anyway, so the, the one of the first things um, I did was try to have an application that would um, control a power wheelchair in um, in um, in in Polyforth, I, I think, and that didn't work out. So about that same time, I ran into a, a tethered fourth uh, for the. Um, uh, 8080 called Gibray Forth, and uh, I remember working on that for a long time. And what's what was really neat about this version of Forth is that um, if you're doing an embedded application, you put um, an 8K kernel of Forth um, on the on the on the hardware and connect it with a serial port, and then you'd be able to develop uh, fourth code um, on your desktop and uh, download it and test it right on the on the actual hardware. And then after you got everything to work, there was a command that basically, you know, uploaded all that code. Um, and then you can burn an EEPROM and uh, plug in the EEPROM and uh, um, you know, the application would come up and the thing would run and that worked out really well. My first thing that I did with it, um, oh yeah, was this application for controlling a power wheelchair. And I did it by using uh, the Polaroid ultrasonic sensors to monitor the, the position of a person's uh, head in the wheelchair because um, you know, we're looking at controlling the wheelchair by with uh, quadriplegics who, who couldn't control a joystick. So basically, it turned into the, the person's head turned into a joystick, and you would just tilt your head in the direction you wanted to go. And the further you tilted in that direction, the faster it would go. And um, I had um, uh, 43 seconds of fame on 60 minutes. And uh, Leslie Stahl was um, interviewed me, and she actually was able to drive the wheelchair around, but that didn't make it into the final cut. So uh, that's my um, fourth experience. And uh, Brad, um, if, uh, you're next. All right. Well, um, so uh, yeah, Brad Nelson, um, <clears throat> I. Uh, of late, you know, I've been uh, tinkering a good bit with uh, a, a variant of uh, fourth called uh, micro e fourth, or <clears throat> excuse me, micro e fourth, or alternately, uh, uh, it's it's known as ESP thirty two fourth when it's on the ESP thirty two. Um, uh, a lot of my energy goes into sort of for for fourth at least goes into working on that at the moment. Um, one of the applications that I've been working on for it, uh, it makes use of. Uh, well, fourth, but also uh, 3D printing is that oops, that's not shut. Let me turn off the. Let me. I'm going to push. I'm going to uh, hold it up this way. So I've got a. Ooh, you can't. You can kind of see it on the camera. I've I've been working on a, um, a bunch of uh, small cameras using uh, a variant of the ESP32 fourth called, uh, or sorry, the ESP32 called the ESP32 Cam, which um, has a camera and an, an SD card. Uh, in addition to the to the usual accoutrements on a on an ESP32, um, and I've I've been making these little plastic cases, and and uh, the idea is that I'm going to use them as a as a small cheap uh, uh, security camera system uh, for my home. So that's sort of work in progress. Uh, 
one one thing I've run into with that that's a little bit challenging is the the cameras uh, that that are stock in, uh, with the ESP32 cam seem to be uh, not particularly great at night vision. So maybe maybe not the best choice of, of cameras, but they're uh, they're cheap and programmable, and I can I can play around with doing interesting things with them. Uh, so that's that's one of the fun things I'm working on. And I I got started with fourth. I don't know. Gosh, I. Uh, uh, I probably I remember very maybe maybe in the in the eighties encountering uh, a uh, a book about uh, sort of uh, history of programming languages or something. I should find that book back actually, and it had a very interesting article on Forth uh, at the time, and uh, it got, piqued my interest and and I sort of hung out on the sidelines until one day I realized wait a minute SV Fig is is right around here. I should go check this out. So. Who would like to go next? Um, how about how about you, Liang? Sorry, uh, what what do you want me to talk about? Uh, how did uh, was, uh, how did you get interested in Forth, and uh, is there something some application you've been working on lately? All right, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I. How did I get into fourth? Yeah, I was actually, I started uh, around 2017, I would say. I was looking for a programming language uh, to that I can use on mobile phones, yeah. So, as you know, maybe around 2017, uh, I think the to program a mobile phone, even today, is uh, very complicated, right? You. If you have tried before, you need to download this uh, Android Studio or whatever, which takes a uh, gigabytes of uh, this space and everything else. So I think that was a starting point. But my uh, interest in Forth is more like the high-level interface. So you see, I, I found the conventional Forth as in, you know, most of the Forth implementation is uh, like, it requires a lot of... Uh, the learning curve is very steep because, uh, you know, for for someone who is uh, either a new programmer or an uh, experienced programmer, if you want to learn all the fourth vocabulary, right, it is uh, not so, uh, you know, interesting. So what I did was that, how, how I started with fourth is that I started to write uh, my own sort of, uh, my own fourth shell in PHP. Now, when I say shell, is that it doesn't have the full vocabulary of fourth. It only have a fourth, uh, uh, like uh, fourth words that that calls the PHP functions. If I need to, right? So now the reason I do that is because uh, you know PHP was uh, used in the web web programming. So I, I did my uh, sort of a fourth shell in PHP. Then I started uh, porting that into uh, JavaScript. And then I, I found that, that that can be done very easily. You know, it, the, the fourth shell is literally just a, a tokenizer and eval, right? Eval as in, you know, you, you just call the native, right? So it, it, it's a very simple, I would say that the original, uh, uh, fourth shell is like 50 lines of code in PHP or JavaScript. And uh, that is how I start learning fourth as in, but not, not the conventional fourth because I I, I don't, uh, I mean, I my, my the application I wrote are like uh, mostly in PHP and JavaScript. So the most recent work I do is actually what I call uh, reverse react notation, right? Now, if you know about React, React is a language uh, based on uh, JavaScript, and it is actually used for uh, mobile phone programming and so on. Now, I call it re reverse React notation, just uh, you know, for the fun, because uh, I turn React into a fourth type of language, right? So, as in fourth language is like reverse Polish notation, so I I can write React in in pure fourth. So even HTML, I can turn uh, HTML into into fourth like uh, reverse Polish notation. So I I I, I now have uh, you know some work uh, that I'm sort of doing. 
I can actually write uh, mobile apps uh, in, uh, you know, very simple uh, fourth. If you want, if you like, I, I, I call it, I mean, in the end, I, I, I decide to, to use the name force script as in P-H-O-S, force as in light, you know. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, what the name doesn't matter, but it's just uh, so that I, I distinguish uh, whatever I implemented from conventional force as in, I, I, I don't use the full vocabulary, but of course, I can implement the full vocabulary just uh, by adding it as an extension. So that's a summary of uh, what I'm doing. Yeah, thank you. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you might consider, uh, you know, putting together a presentation for fourth day, um, if you would, because that sounds really interesting. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I I will do that. Uh, yeah. Sure. Who who do I contact for that? Uh. You know the uh, preparation. Yeah. Uh. Talk to uh, Kevin Effort. Okay. Yeah. I have his email. Yeah. I will I'll yeah, respond. That'd be, that'd be great. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh. Let's go with uh, Dennis. Next. There we are. Now you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Thank oh, you. And I, yeah, I, I've been running around trying to get a demo. It's not fourth yet, but I'm intending it to be. And I figured this, seeing that this is recent and it is an application. Um, so I have some of the qualifications, but okay. Um, it, I'm working at T-Mobile right now. Um, I, I've been promoted to be the architect, um, mostly because the existing architect left. And so I had to step in. And what we are working on is this DevEdge thing. And I've talked about this before. And there we go. Yes, it's there. Um, so this is, and I'll reboot it. Could you uh, please keep um, your presentation, you know, really short, you know, just a few minutes. Yep. yep. If, very, if you have a... very quick. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm just going to show a little bit around here. This is it rebooting. Um, the RTCC is one of the things that I'm working on right now. And... We've got a few errors, but okay, that's fine. We're connected up to the, um, we're connected to the internet effectively. Not sure, what, what, but we're fine there. And this is basically the system that we've got right now. And what I've done mostly is work on i'm not even sure it's in here um yeah this is a manufacturing test that's running and that's all i'm really going to show right now um it's doing a bunch of stuff on testing the hardware and making sure that the hardware works and does that type of stuff and it's got an external I squared C connector on it. So cool. And that's about it. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Um, again, you know, if you want to make a longer presentation, you know, we have certainly have time um, in uh, next month and on fourth day. So uh, consider those options. So let's see. Yeah, I, I, I'm intending on it, but I've been too busy to do much of anything else than get this stuff going. And um, yeah. so, but yeah, I will, I, I will keep that in mind and do it as soon as I have time to put something together. Okay. This, this is something I already have. Okay. Uh, appreciate your efforts. Uh, let's go with uh, Barbara Armstrong next. Uh, just a few minutes worth of stuff. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, one of the things is, oh, 
in terms of when I uh, heard of uh, Loan Forth, it was when the Byte magazine came out. I was uh, doing uh, APL programming at, uh, at uh, Xerox headquarters and in Rochester. And actually, uh, Rochester used to be a hub for Forth, uh, too. But anyway, some guys invited me out to go to the Webster Computing Center or from there, go see Tron. And um, the Byte magazine came out. The guy said, boy, if you like APL, you should uh, check out Forth. And um, I learned enough so that when a guy named Ryo Osaki created the Ampere uh, laptop computer, very 1984, um, which had APL as uh, in in you know in ROM, um, I suggested he ought to check out Forth. Um, um, but anyway, that was that was back in the days, uh, the pioneer days when the arrows were flying. They still are. But let me see. Can I share my screen? Yeah, because I just I recently um, gave. Um, a presentation at Euroforth. I participated in Euroforth, and uh, uh, here's some. My this will this will be um, uploaded in my public uh, web space. And one other thing, just the other day, um, I uh, participated in uh, the uh, British APL Association Zoom. And they're looking at adding the dialogue APL is the top APL. And uh, the thing is, it's gone in the direction of, of more and more complexity in the syntax. And, and the RPN syntax, and, and this is presented in, in my uh, Euroforth uh, presentation, is just tremendously more flexible. I mean, COSI is sort of an APL at an APL level, although the interface needs to be switched to, the, to a web interface. But in terms of the flexibility of the RPN syntax and the simplicity of, of, of the fourth, uh, it's just simply unmatched. But um, uh, I did this. They were talking about having some standard for being able to write a, a, the, the desk description of, of an array linearly. And I just went and gave this um, this line to go and show um, creation. Essentially, this tick goes and says, execute everything from there to the matching tick and make a list out of it. And so this is a list, a couple of integers, um, uh, and then and then um, a list of a couple more. And so this is nested in this list. So in any case, oh, and one of the things, Brad, I really, I, I've, I've looked at the 3D printing, um, the structure of the database, the database structure, which actually seems to me very, very straightforward, a list of nodes to form uh, simplexes uh, to, to cover surface. Or, or, and boy, I'd, I'd, I'd really like to do that because definitely sometime, um, I really want to start making 3D sculptures of my 2D projection of a six cube. And actually, I sort of need to go and have the fundamental structure to make a tube. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's, let's move on because we've got uh, uh, more people to, uh, uh, to present. Okay, could you? Uh, right. Let's go with uh, Sam next. Just a couple oh, I, minutes. I am falling behind. Uh, so uh, my name is Sam Felvo. My first experience with Forth was in the 90s. Um, my first exposure to it was maybe late 80s, but my first actual hands-on experience was 90s thereabouts with Pygmy Forth running under DOS. Um, had a blast. Um, it has corrupted me for life. Um, and uh, I've been enamored with Forth ever since. Um, I am in the process of making a uh, homebrew computer of my own design, um, uh, which I'm currently calling the fourth box that is kind of inspired by the Jupiter Ace and a few other computers. Um, I am probably half a year to maybe three quarters of a year late in my progress on that due to work uh, and various other uh, life interventions. But um, 
I am slowly plugging away on that and stay tuned here to SV Fig for, for updates on that. Uh, thanks, Sam. Uh, Jurgen, let's go with you next. Okay, he may be away from keyboard. So let's go with um, Stefan, Stephen. That's Stephen. Okay, thank you. Just a couple minutes worth. Okay, so my name is Stephen Adels. I live in New Jersey, across from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, years ago, I started with Fox Pro and then moved on to SQL Server and C-Sharp.net. And uh, during my, I guess I worked at that for about 25 years professionally, those three. And uh, during that time, I, I became more like a language researcher and uh, decided that, you know, I would try to find, you know, the best language or a better language to, to write code in. So um, I, I started that it, by reading a book called Code Complete. Uh, by Steve McConnell. And in that, uh, in that book, uh, Steve McConnell says that we basically write about the same number of lines of code per day. And, but he also said that, um, so if we wanna be the most productive, we wanna write in the language of the business, like a domain specific language, we wanna write in the language of the problem domain. And uh, so when I was researching my languages, I came across fourth and I was impressed because it was, it was able to span from, from low level all the way up to high level. And that it was, it was able to write complete entire operating system and application from, from beginning to end. So, um, so lately I've been trying to build my own fourth in C sharp and I failed miserably twice, but I will keep trying until I succeed. <laughs> so I'm very impressed with the, um, with fourth. Um, I'm still confused about, uh, I, I identified that um, Lisp, Lisp is one of the most amazing languages and uh, because of the macros, if, and I'm thinking like, where are the macros in fourth? And I'm thinking, well, fourth is seem, actually seems to be simple enough and powerful enough that it actually almost doesn't need macros. So I'm, I'm thinking, uh, so anyway, I, this is about where I am. I guess I'm done. Any questions, anyone? Yeah, no, no questions. We're just having, um, you know, right. brief, brief, brief presentations. And right. so after after we're all done with um, uh, the um, Sam's presentation, uh, they'll we'll have we'll keep the um, the Zoom open and then you can have a discussion. Okay. Um, okay. Before I move on, um, I'm sort of responding to um, Bob's recollection of the Byte magazine uh, with fourth in it and. I actually have uh, that that cover, um, and it was given to me in 1989. Um, I don't know why, uh, but it has a certificate of authenticity. So I just wonder if I brought this to the Antiques Roadshow, how much it might be worth. <laughs> By the way, I, I got a comment. I actually think that that cover and an awful lot of the material in Byte was more complicated than Forth is itself. Yeah, uh, not sure I recall that. Okay, let's uh, move on to uh, David Henderson. Okay. He may not be around. Okay, let's go with uh, John. Yes. Hi. Thank you. My name is John Masuria. I live in uh, South Florida and uh, I'm a relative newcomer to Forth. And I, I'm amazed that I never encountered Forth in my career. I started in the mid 70s in high school in, in New York learning uh, Fortran. Uh, I went to the University of Miami. They had a UNIVAC mainframe system and I was an electrical engineering major, but I fell in love with systems programming on the UNIVAC mainframe, learned assembler, COBOL, PL1. 
Um, I worked at Eastern Airlines for a while, uh, worked for Unisys, which Univac eventually became Unisys. And I now, and I've been at Carnival Cruise Lines for over 30 years, uh, still working on, I love, uh, have raspberry pies. I love the raspberry pie. I love the ESP32. Um, I love the, the pie Pico. And I'm, again, I'm, I'm amazed at uh, the amazing programs that you're all able to do uh, with fourth. I see it as a very, uh, very interesting language and I'm trying to my be very best to, to, it's very different from any other language um, that I've, uh, that I've encountered. So, and I'm in thoroughly enjoying uh, these meetings and a lot of, a lot of history and Byte Magazine was my favorite magazine in the eighties. I'm surprised I never uh, saw the, the article on fourth. I wish I had. Okay, uh, John, thank you very much for your thoughts. Uh, let's go back um, to see if uh, Jurgen is around. Jurgen, if you're there, please unmute and uh, there you go. Well, I'm coming from a completely different direction. I'm a hardware person and I got interested in fourth uh, when I did some uh, consulting uh, on the marketing side for MPE. Well, that was about 10 years ago. And uh, now about 10 years later, we got about um, 20 books on my bookshelf about Forth. I like Forth because it's easy. It's very close to hardware. And as I heard from uh, at the beginning of this uh, meeting, there are loads of people who talk about fourth, but not very many who talk about applications. And that's the major issue I have with the language. It's like everybody likes to build a car, but nobody wants to win a race. So uh, I think that's about what I can say. Thank you very much for the time. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Jurgen. Okay. Uh, see, uh, David Henderson uh, is around. So you can give us a, a, a few minutes about yourself sure. and um, any application that you've done with Fourth that you'd like to talk about. Yeah, actually, I've done. Uh, I think my first the first Fourth app was in uh, college. Uh, Use sixty C sixty four Fourth to to uh, put together an interface for Selectric typewriter. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, and uh, and had it running at like ten characters per second. It was all hardwired, written in fourth uh, on S fourth on C sixty four, and you know doing it at midnight with a full speed Selectric in a dorm room is is a good way to make your neighbors uh, upset at you. Um, but it was a fun project. And then uh, from a, a practical point of view, uh, I work for a timber company, and we would put forth out in embedded systems, uh, 1802 and, and, and uh, I think 6502 uh, systems out in the field, all put in a metal box. And uh, then the, uh, probably the, um, I was in a robotics uh, class, uh, robotics uh, club at ASU. I'm over here in Tempe and uh, used an NMI, if you're familiar with it, New Micros Inc, uh, 65, 68, HC11 with a really nice fourth on it. It was really like that system and wired it up to do Sumo Robot. And uh, oh. well, the nice thing about fourth was the other people were compiling and putting the stuff in, but I could take it off to the side, update it, upload the program, and then run the next round with an improved program. So that's what I really liked about fourth is, is you can uh, refine it as you go. And um, I still use uh, Fourth now, but uh, mostly for vintage computers. Uh, I go to the Vintage Computer Festival over at Mountain View and present. And uh, anyway, the uh, latest I'm working on is Jupyter Ace programs on uh, Jupyter Ace, and it's a really fun Fourth. Uh, little, little nice, nice parts of it that make it easier to use for a cassette-based system. So that's really all. I don't program Fourth at work or anything. I'm, I work on C. But, I really like Forth uh, as a hobby right now. Uh, David, thanks so much. Uh, thank everybody for your, your thoughts and presentations. Uh, you might, uh, again, I'm gonna push for um, 
for people to uh, uh, present at fourth day in, in November. Um, you know, even if you have something uh, short or it's from, um, from many years ago, uh, I think it'd be interesting for all of us to hear. So uh, put that um, in your mind and uh, you have a couple months to, to work on it. And if you want to uh, practice it uh, next month, October, SVPIG would be a good time to do that. So uh, th again, thank everybody. I want to thank everybody for your, um, uh, for your presentations. And it's good to hear the variety of things that people um, have done with, with Fort and their introduction to Fort. So um, with that, um, let's move on to uh, Sam Falvo and- his... Hold on a minute. Uh, uh, yeah, Stephen, what's, what's up? Um, I was just wondering if you had any guidance for what, for what possibly, I guess, uh, a presentation could be made. Yeah, uh, please uh, contact uh, Kevin Appert um, okay. He'll be, he'll be um, you know, the host of, he's the host of the SV fake meetings in fourth day and okay. be able to, to give you information. And, okay. Um, and you have his email address as well? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. To talk to. All right. Sam, are, are you ready for your presentation? No, but I'll do this anyway. <laughs> I'm sure you will. 